So let's see. Some of the students, I think, are in the Olympic seminar. And so rather than start right in with the lecture, I thought I would try to answer some questions. That some of you may have. So. One question for me. As I mentioned, I don't read the book of grades. So which means I don't have that question either. Does anybody else have any questions? All right. Well, there are a number of topics that I could discuss. One, instead of answering questions, I could review Yang Mills' theory. Say some things about functional integration. Although, actually, I was going to put them in this lecture. Maybe I should just start the lecture. I should just do that. Or would you rather review Yang Mills' theory? Yeah, review Yang Mills' theory. All right. Why don't you stop the tape for a second, then, because I have to go get my notes on that. It says the panel of this group is huge. Well, it's worth quite a bit of information. It's where all the funding is, right? Exactly. All right. So let's see. All right. I guess this is. All right. So now, so you guys need to tell me, though, should I go faster or slower? OK. So the idea is you have a vector psi of x, which conventionally is written like that as a column vector of fields, depending on the space-time point x. And if we adopt vector and matrix notation, then the idea of a gauge transformation is that we multiply the vector by, in this case, an n by n matrix, g of x. And so that means you have a transformation of the fields. Now, these are a symmetry transformation if the action, which is the integral of the Lagrange density over space-time, and the Lagrange density, of course, involves the fields. And so it's L of psi and I don't know which notation we like, but d mu psi. And of course, the point x, d fourth x, if s is invariant under this transformation, then this is a symmetry. And if g actually depends upon this point x, then it's called a local symmetry. Or equivalently, a gauge symmetry. So a gauge symmetry is one in which the transformation depends upon the space-time point x. And 
Now, if this is a symmetry for a given G, and it's also a symmetry for another G, then what you could say is, for example, in other words, you would have a product of two matrices, n by n matrices, at the same space-time point, and you still, if the action is still invariant, then what you have is you have invariance under a group, a group of transformations, and this group of transformations, since they're n by n matrices, will in general, these matrices in general will not commute with each other, and so it will be a non-abelian group, and so this is a non-abelian case here. So that's basically the, that's the definition of what a non-abelian gauge theory is, and then in order to have an action invariant, one needs to define what's called a covariant derivative, and the idea is that the covariant derivative under a gauge transformation should just turn into, should behave the same way the field behaves. In other words, the field is psi prime of x is g of x psi of x, and so what one wants is to have the derivatives of the field transform the same way. The ordinary derivatives won't transform the same way, but we can define something that will transform the same way, and that's called the covariant derivative. Do ask questions. These notes are all online. I wouldn't try to follow in the book or anything. I mean, if you want to. Can I just ask one quick question? I'm sorry I was late, but what is the, right now, the main topic? Is it just generally non-abelian theories? Yeah, well, non-abelian gauge theories is the main topic of the second semester, and it's been the main topic of the last month or so of the first semester, and the reason is that the standard model and all extensions of the standard model except for string theory are non-abelian gauge theories. String theory is something that in the low energy limit gives you a non-abelian gauge theory. So it's in that sense that it's important to do this. So what we want is we want this to be the case, and so what that means basically is we know how psi transforms under gauge transformation. So this is saying the d prime mu of x psi prime of x should be this, but that's d prime mu of x d of x psi of x. So the equation that we have then is g d mu psi of x should be d prime g psi of x, or in other words, g of x d mu of x is d prime mu of x d of x. And that gives us a recipe for how d transforms, namely d prime of x should be g inverse of x. No, I'm sorry, g of x d mu of x d inverse of x. So this is the way in which a covariant derivative transforms. And it turns out that it's possible to have such a transformation if we just turn the ordinary derivative. Here I'm using the notation d mu is 
partial, partial X mu. So D mu plus something we'll call A mu of X. This is, in fact, what's done in electrodynamics, but here we'll see that A is a matrix. Am I going too slowly for some of you? Or is it good to repeat this? It's probably good to repeat it. Okay. So, what will this look like then? Well, if we just look at this equation, it will be G of X, D mu plus A mu of X, G inverse of X, should be D prime, and D prime is D mu plus A mu prime of X. Maybe I should try to call Tom to tell him that that thing is kind of all right. That's so we can get a better camera. Okay, so that's the equation. And we can see that this derivative here can act on G inverse, or it can stay a live derivative, in which case it cancels this because it's multiplied by G G inverse. In other words, suppressing the X. Hello? We have G G inverse D mu plus G D mu G inverse plus G A mu G inverse equals D mu plus A mu prime. Okay? And so this, rewriting this since G G inverse is 1, this is D mu, hello? Plus G D mu G inverse plus G A mu G inverse equals D mu plus A mu prime. So this tells us that A mu prime is G A mu G inverse plus G D mu G inverse. So this tells us how this A mu prime has to transform. I don't know what's going on here. I dialed this number in. Any questions? Tom, they just broke. So maybe you can get the camera and we bring it back. All right, so... So let's see. I think... I think I... So this is the general structure of a non-abelian gauge theory. For an abelian gauge theory, the simplest example is EDI theta of X, and this is how quantum electrodynamics or ordinary electrodynamics works. Then uh, A mu prime of X is just, by this would be EDI theta A mu E minus I theta plus EDI theta D mu E to the minus I theta. And so altogether, these space factors just cancel and you get A mu of minus I D mu of theta of X. So this is how the gauge field, the electromagnetic field transforms. And that's just classic electrodynamics. In the case of um, SU2 gauge theory, then G of X is e to the i theta of x dotted into sigma over 2. That's the conventional way of doing it. And um, these notes are online. I don't think I should go through the whole shtick here. Um, let me just say what an infinitesimal transformation is. It turns out to be this is if if theta is very small, that is to say, 
if we say theta is equal to an infinitesimal vector epsilon, then this is, then it turns out that you need three A's, one for each of the generators, sigma. And this is this minus epsilon A, B, C, epsilon B, A, C, mu minus I, D, mu, epsilon A. This epsilon A, B, C comes about because of the structure constant. Sigma A over 2, sigma B over 2 is I, epsilon A, B, C, sigma C over 2, summing over C. And epsilon A, B, C is the totally anti-symmetric three tensor. So epsilon 1, 2, 3 is 1, but it's totally anti-symmetric. So epsilon 2, 1, 2 minus 1, epsilon 1, 1, 2, 0, and so forth. All right, so I think maybe that's enough of a review. What do you think? All right, let me just say something about what these. I just had one question. Yes. So these generators of the whatever symmetry group, to each of those there will be a conserved current, right? Excuse me? Corresponding to each of these generators of the gauge group, there will be a conserved current. Interesting question. Yeah, I think that one can say that, yeah. Right. And what's interesting is there's the conserved current and there's the gauge invariant current. And I'm not sure that they're actually the same. So let me think about that. Why don't we talk after class and we can focus in on that. Let me just add in, just say what the action then is. In electrodynamics, this Lagrange density is minus a quarter F mu nu, F mu nu. Well, it's that, and then it's also plus psi bar, what's called I d slash minus M psi. This d slash is Feynman's notation, gamma mu, d mu. The gamma matrices, you remember, are matrices such as gamma mu, gamma nu. Anti-commutator is 2 g mu nu or equivalently 2 eta mu nu, where in flat space time, this eta mu nu is 2. It's either minus 1, 1, 1, 1, as in Weinberg, or you multiply everything by minus 1, you get the Peskin-Schroeder convention. In an Arnabelian case, S is an integral minus a quarter F a mu nu, F mu nu a plus psi bar I d slash minus M psi d fourth x. And now F a mu nu is d mu a a mu minus d mu a a mu plus g F a b c a b a c mu nu. These are the structure constants of which epsilon a b c is a particular example for SU2. This d mu is actually a matrix, and it's d mu delta alpha beta minus I g a a mu t a 
alpha, beta, where the T's are the generators, so you have TA, TB, TI, FABC, TC. Whoops, I somehow have upper indices. For compact non-indicated groups, there's no point in raising and lowering the group indices. So, let's see. The Let me back up now and switch to a brief review of the pathogens. The basic idea of the pathogen is to compute matrix elements of either the time evolution operator or the statistical density matrix, if you want, E to the minus beta times the Hamiltonian. And these are basically obtained by just taking the matrix elements and then chopping these exponentials into products of many tiny slices. And so you have E to the minus I, DTH, and then you put in a complete set of states here and here, like that and like that, and then you have another one, E to the minus I, DTH, and so forth. And you just form this product. And this is described in this online, on my online notes here from this math book that I'm writing, which is bio.phys.un.edu. Now, you can find it under 524. It's a little easier to find if you look under 466, which is the course that I sort of wrote for, 466, 467. So you can go to either place, but it's easier to find if you go there. Now, these pattern integrals are based on Gaussian integrals, and the Gaussian integrals are E to the minus I, A, X minus T over 2A squared, DX, and this is the square root of pi over pi A. Another version of this is E to the minus R, X minus T over 2R squared, DX. The product product is one fancy way of doing it, yes. So, what does this mean? Well, what does this break down mean? What does it break down? Well, that's a good question. I don't know. Breakdown isn't something I like to think about. And why don't we talk about that after the class? There is an example that is way in the back of my head that is a case in which the normal pattern of formula that you expect doesn't occur and you need a complicated extra factor. But whether that's a breakdown of the product formula or whether it just follows from this, I don't know. Okay, so if you just multiply out these exponentials, you see there's a piece, of course, that doesn't depend upon x in both cases. 
And so that means that you have the integral minus infinity to plus infinity e to the minus i a x squared plus i b x dx is equal to square root of pi over i a e to the i b squared over 4a and integral minus infinity to plus infinity e to the minus rx squared plus cx dx is square root of pi over r e to the c squared over 4r. I don't know why I use so many different letters, but um, anyway, these, these, um, um, in, are there caveats on what a can be given that it's multiplied by Oh, five? hey, that's a very, very good question. I should have mentioned that. Um, this top equation is for real a and b. And um, the bottom one is r greater than 0. And uh, c can be complex. So c is complex, but obviously uh, r. Well, I'm saying here positive r. r could probably be complex as long as the real part is positive. Um, but that should probably end. Yeah. But for the applications that um, path integrals, what we do is we, um, we have these integrals. Minus infinity plus infinity e to the minus epsilon p squared over 2m plus i epsilon q dot p dp is square root of 2 pi, 2 pi m over epsilon e to the minus epsilon a half m q dot squared. Okay, so you see, for a free particle, the Hamiltonian across is p squared over 2 m, epsilon is dt. The q, the q dot p comes from inserting uh, eigenstates of q, the matrix elements of eigenstates of q with eigenstates of p. And that gives you uh, this term. So you have Q at two different terms. And um, so that's how that works. Um, I'm just wondering, why does one bother with the Q states at all in the case of um, uh, the case in which the Hamiltonian is just P squared? Normally, you have a B of Q in there. You were going to say? I mean, the, the propagator is between some initial Q rate to some final. Like right, you said, uh, right. Different Qs. So you, you insert these time slices, which you integrate all of them over all the possible Q values. Yeah, but just to pursue this a little bit, it, this, of course, is the the, um, the e to the minus theta h case. Um, even if you had a q here, you could um, insert the p's. And then you have one factor here. But then you have e to the minus h p squared over 2m. And then you could put another p here, so p1, p2, and so forth. Yeah. Yeah, you can do that. Right. And yeah, I guess the point is you could do that, but then that would just give you a formula for e to the minus epsilon p squared between q states, and um, it would be correct, but. Um, 
you wouldn't get a pathological formulation from it. Anyway, so one inserts these QN P states instead of just that. The, the fact is, though, you have to insert Q states in the case, the normal case, in which the Hamiltonian involves a function of Q as well as a function of P. So you have a B of Q as well as a P squared. Um, and the other term is e to the minus i epsilon p squared over 2m plus i epsilon q dot p dp is square root of 2 pi, that's a pi, m. And now we go to i epsilon e to the i epsilon and half m q dot squared. OK, so those are the basic integrals one uses to do the path integrals. I don't think I should go through the whole shtick about path integrals. But there is one aspect of it that um, I didn't emphasize when I went through this in the course that I think I should emphasize now. Um, and it's, uh, let's just, let me just go quickly to the matrix generalization of these. For example, you can have minus infinity to plus infinity e to the, and I'll just use summation convention. Whoops, this is a C. X i squared plus C i X i D X i. So we're doing D X one D X and let us say capital N. This thing then just using this formula N times, you see it is um, pi to the N over two divided by um, product of R1 up to Rn, big square root, and then E to the one quarter Ti squared over Ri summed over I. And um, if you rewrite that in matrix notation, it can be written as E to the minus X transpose of matrix R, which is diagonal in this case, X plus C transpose X, C dot X if you want. And um, dx1, dxn. And then this is again pi to the n over 2. And now this is the determinant of r, the square root of the determinant of r. And then this is the p to the 1 quarter c transpose r inverse c. Okay, well, this, um, any positive. Symmetric matrix S can be diagonalized as O R O transpose, and um, so we can. So th this is a, a, a multiple Gaussian integral involving a diagonal matrix, but we can go to a generalize it to an arbitrary positive symmetric matrix by just uh, inverting this formula and. In other words, setting R equal to O transpose S O. O is orthogonal, so O transpose O is the identity. And um, if we now substitute for R in this equation, what we get is an integral E to the minus X transpose O transpose S O X plus C transpose X. And I'll just write this. Let me write this as capital D X just to make it easier. Pi to the N over 2 divided by square root of determinant. And the determinant of S and the determinant of R are the same because the product of the determinants, the determinant of a product is the product of determinants. And the determinant of an orthogonal matrix, in fact, is unitary. Unit. Um, so it's this, and then E to the one quarter C transpose O transpose S inverse O C. So I'm also writing, well, no, I'm just substituting for R. 
And then if we write y is equal to ox, um, and then we realize that, and we also said d equal to oc, d is probably a bad choice in notation, but d is oc. Um, and then we notice that the Jacobian partial y partial x, the determinant of that is just 1 because this is an orthogonal transformation. What we get is integral e to the minus y transpose sy plus d transpose y dy, or since we're changing x to y, I'll write this more carefully, dy1, dyn equals pi to the n over 2 divided by square root of the determinant of s. And now e to the 1 quarter d transpose s inverse d. So that's a general formula. And the anal is an analogous formula for um, the imaginary case. In other words, e to the mi minus i h t. And that's e to the minus i y transpose s y plus i d transpose y. And then again, so I'll just write it as dy is equal to, again, pi to the n over 2 divided by the square root of the determinant of i s uh, e to the i over 4 e transpose s inverse d. Okay, so you might wonder why have I gone through this in so much detail. Well, there's actually an important lesson here that's very general and of, of, of some use. Let's, let's look at this, uh, the argument of this exponential. And let's ask if this is a quadratic form and why. We can ask ourselves, when is this stationary? Well, it's in fact stationary, of course, at the minimum. In fact, had I not expanded these roots, we'd be over here at this, and we'd be asking the question, when it, look at this exponential, for what value of x is this exponential stationary? Well, the value of x, when it's stationary, is at the bottom of this thing. It's when x is equal to c divided by 2r. And um, so that's when, when it's uh, stationary. And what what you can do then is say, well, when this thing is stationary, the value of the exponential is just unity. And so and you can see then that this integral is equal to unity times a factor square root of pi over r. Well, if we go over here. And we look at this instead in this, this form. We would say, well, when is this exponential here stationary? Well, it's stationary for y bar equal to 1 half s inverse d. So now, if we substitute y equal to 1 half s inverse d in this expression here, what we get is that. Um, just, just to verify that, what we would get from this would be minus y transpose is d transpose. S is symmetric, so it's just s inverse. There's a 1 half, then there's an s, and then there's a y, which is a 1 half s inverse d. And then there's this term, which is d transpose 1 half s inverse d. Well, if you cancel the s with the s inverse, you say that th you see this is minus a quarter d transpose s inverse d plus a half d transpose s inverse d. Well, that indeed is a quarter d transpose s inverse d. 
You can do the same thing over here. You can say, when is this exponential, uh, this, the, the argument of the exponential stationary? And in this case, it's um, y bar equals uh, S inverse d over 2. Again, I'm wondering, did, did I make Yeah, they have the same stationary point. That's curious. Let me just just in my notes here. Maybe this is a typo. Right? In any event, yeah, I guess it. I guess the, the the eyes cancel here when you do that. Anyway, if you then substitute for this in this exponential, what you get is that exponential. All right. So there's a lesson. Here. You have a multiple Gaussian integral. You can evaluate the multiple Gaussian integral by finding the stationary point in the argument of, of the exponential, and then just writing that whole multiple Gaussian integral apart from the factor is an exponential of whatever this is evaluated the stationary point. And the same thing here. This whole Gaussian integral is, apart from a factor, it's the exponential of the argument of the exponential evaluated at the stationary point. Now you might say, why is he going on and on and on about this? Well, the reason is that for the case of path integrals, the same thing is true. Path integrals are just multiple Gaussian integrals. And, uh, or at least a part of the path integral that you can actually do is a multiple Gaussian integral. And so you can evaluate an arbitrary path integral by replacing some of the fields with their values at the stationary points. And you get then the right answer apart from a, uh, a prefactor. But of course, you're always computing ratios of path, of path integrals. And so you don't care about the three factors because they cancel. Is that mine or somebody else's? So it's not bringing any anything. Um, and it's often true that this S just involves derivatives and not other fields, in which case this thing is some number. I mean, it's a crazy number like the, 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 the determinant of a four-dimensional delta function with some derivatives acting on it. But that still is just some number. It doesn't involve field variables. And so it cancels out. Kind of. One of the nice things about pad integrals is that you don't need to sweat the small stuff. All right, so let me get a drink of water or coffee. Um, are there any, what, oh, I forgot to bring some chocolate. Um, all right, I'm going to go get the chocolate, and I owe you several pieces. <laughs> You're still going to plug this part?
Yeah, uh, to, to, to do this derivation, S was just a, uh, well, in one case, it was a positive symmetric matrix. Yes. Positive meaning that when you diagonalize it, yeah. the eigenvalues are non-negative, let's say. Or maybe we need it to be positive. Let's say positive just for safety. Um, so what was the question? So what if it isn't? What if it is not? Oh, well, I mean, you know, uh, you've got to go back to these basic integrals here. Um, S came from this thing here. So it really could be complex. It's just that the real that the real part of the eigenvalues have to be uh, positive. But they could certainly have some imaginary parts that wouldn't do any harm at all. So in each integration variable, we have to get something of that kind. Is that the plan? Well, the, the idea was I took this and wrote it as an n-dimensional integral. Yes. Now, this, and then I rewrote it in matrix notation where this was diagonal. Yes. And the important thing about the diagonal is that the, the real parts of the diagonal entries have to be positive. Yes. Okay. But then I say, well, um, with an orthogonal transformation, we're not going to do any harm here. So we can just rewrite this in terms of this orthogonal transformation. Then we've generalized to a case where this is a, uh, a symmetric matrix, but, and symmetric because we started out with yes. diagonal and did OO transpose. So it's a symmetric matrix. And the, the, the point is that, that its eigenvalues have to have positive real parts. So I guess it always has to be a symmetric matrix. If you have something non-symmetric, then you can never get back by an orthogonal transformation to that form. Right. So now, okay. So let's. Yeah. You know, I mean, so 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 it's what you're asking is, can one generalize this? And it, it's probably true that you can generalize it more than I have. <laughs> the, I, I think if you, so the idea here was that you, once in each individual variable, it has to correspond to an integral of this kind. Of. Well, that's, that's the way I'm deriving it. Um, you know, of course, if you really were just, uh, if you were interested in generalizing it mathematically without any regard to the physics, then you could make a salad of these things. Yeah, you could mix this with that. Yeah, so there would be some of the So then it would be more complicated, yeah. But, and there would just be unitary transformation. It, yeah, it might wind up to be that. And of course, what one might be able to do would be to generalize this to a singular value decomposition. Then you'd have an arbitrary matrix. Yeah. Now, whether that's possible or not, I don't know. But that's, that's perhaps worth, worth thinking about. Might even be a paper on that. Okay. Um, now, the reason why I um, wanted to emphasize this was, or to go through it in detail, is that um, when I was doing the path integrals, I, just, I think I, I don't think I went through this, did I? You did. Huh? You did. Did you? Including this business that you can do the you can do the integral just by finding the stationary point. I think towards the end you do. Yeah. Okay. All right. But I mentioned it, but I didn't. I didn't go through it in detail. That's what it is. Okay. Well, let's go now to um, the case of um, a uh, yang mill theory and. Um, So we'll be talking about the Lagrange density that I already wrote on the board over there, so there's no point in rewriting it. Um, and the question is then, what do you do to, um, to uh, quantize this theory? So I'm, I'm going to review. Shall I review this or not? Uh, 
It's it's the business of the actual gauge quantization. Um, um, I I would like to see that again. It's been time. Since all, right. That. all right. Let's 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 see. So pi alpha zero is the partial of the Lagrange density with respect to the time derivative of p zero alpha. Now. What you can see from the structure of this, let me go over here, the structure of F mu nu, F mu nu is anti-symmetric. So if nu is zero, and, and you want mu to be zero, so that you get a time derivative of the zero component, you need both mu and nu to be zero, but then f mu nu itself would be zero because it's anti-symmetric in mu and nu. So you'd have d0 a a zero minus d0 a a zero plus g f a b c, which is anti-symmetric, a b zero a c zero. The anti-symmetry in b c would make that zero. These two terms would cancel. So f a zero zero any non-abelian gauge theory, also any abelian gauge theory. The result is that there isn't any term d0, a0. And so this derivative here is 0. So that says that the momentum canonically conjugate to this particular variable is 0. So that's a constraint. If you find the, the Lagrange's equation for the zeroth component, it's the following. It's minus d mu partial L partial d mu A alpha zero. Here I'm following Weinberg's notes, which I put online, well, Weinberg's book actually. Plus partial L partial A alpha zero. And this looks slightly unfamiliar because he introduced an overall minus sign. I'm not sure why. But anyway, this is d mu f alpha mu zero plus f gamma mu zero. And I'm going to. He uses capital C for the structure constants. I suppose that's. Probably a better notation, but anyway, since I use F, I'm staying with that. Plus J0 alpha. J0 alpha is just the derivative of um, the matter of Lagrangian. just dk and the if you do the other ones here pi alpha k which is partial L partial d0 alpha k a alpha k this will be um, f um, let me get my indices right I think that's right. Anyway, it's apart from a minus sign, it's equal to that. And so this, so this is, these are the, mom, the momentum conjugate to fields one, two, three, as opposed to field zero, is just the um, f uh, f. Um, 
Let me see. If that's down, the zero is up, and you can raise that. So that's actually the way he does it. In Cousin Weinberg's notation, the you can raise or lower a space index without a minus sign. Anyway, so this is um, dk of pi k alpha plus, and now this is pi k gamma f gamma alpha beta a beta mu plus j alpha zero equals zero. This is the non-abelian form of Gauss's law. This is effectively the covariant derivative of the momentum is um, minus the charge density. So it's the non-abelian form of Gauss's law. Anyway, so there are these two constraints, that pi alpha zero is zero, and then Gauss's law, which is just the non-abelian version of Gauss's law. And um, so the, the way we want to analyze this, such a theory is to fix a gauge. And in, in the non abelian case, what people often do is choose what's called the axial gauge. And that's A alpha 3 equals 0. Alpha here for SU2 runs from 1 to 3. For SU3, it runs from 1 to 8. And so one sets the z component of the field equal to 0. Um, and now uh, I'm going to use the notation i runs from 1 to 2, k runs from 1 to 2 to 3. And of course, mu goes from 1 to 1 to 3, to, from 0 to and um, now the, the electric field strengths are Fi0 alpha is pi alpha i, and F30 alpha is, well, we've set A3 equal to 0. So if you look at the expression for F mu nu, you see there's only one term that's left, and it's the z derivative of A alpha uh, 0. And now, if you substitute those in here, you find this constraint is actually minus d3 squared a0 alpha is equal to the divergence of these conjugate momenta here, which are really the electric fields, um, plus the color electric fields, plus pi gamma i f gamma alpha beta a beta i plus g zero alpha. Okay. So what you can do is you can solve for a zero in terms of these other variables, the conjugate, the electric field in the one and two direction, and the gauge fields in the one and two direction, and the matter current. This matter current is just something involving psi dagger and psi. And so this tells you then that this is a dependent variable. Just as it was when we did QED, we solved Gauss's law for A0, expressed in terms of the charges. There, though, it was much simpler. We were dealing with an abelian gauge theory, and there you can, if you're in Coulomb's gauge as opposed to the axial gauge, uh, or if you're in the axial gauge, you can express the, the, um, the, uh, field A0 in terms of the charge density. It's just, just to remind you, it's something like this, um, 1 over 4 pi integral. If J, I let J0 be the charge density rho, then it's um, rho of x uh, prime d cubed x prime So that's the case, that's for an abelian gauge theory in the Coulomb gauge. In this case, it's more complicated. By the way, the, 
the, you might say, why aren't we doing the Coulomb gauge here? Well, Schwinger actually worked this out for the Coulomb gauge. Um, but then about 10 or so years after that, a Soviet mathematician, Grebov, and um, I met Grebov um, once actually, or twice mainly. He's a very heavy smoker and he's no longer with us. Um, I, I remember he gave a seminar at MIT and the place was packed because he was this illustrious Soviet mathematician who was, was during the Cold War who um, was visiting. So everybody who had come on in this MIT room was only this big. And so you know, the MIT professors all got to sit in front of the and the postdoc pilot and, and then the people from other universities were sitting there working. I think it was a half hour into his lecture before I even got into the room. But in any event, um, what was Grebov famous for then? What he was famous for, he was pointing out that um, in a non-abelian gauge theory, if you try to solve Gauss's, the Gauss's, if you have the condition del dot A equals zero, del dot A alpha equals zero, and you then try to solve Gauss's law for A0 alpha. Even with the condition that A alpha should vanish at infinity, um, there are solutions that differ by finite gauge transformations. So you don't fix the gauge with the Coulomb gauge condition. That was Grebov's. This is called the Grebov ambiguity. Grebov also said something else that I think is very interesting and possibly true, and has been almost completely ignored, which is he suggested that the confinement of quarks may be because the human D quark has such light masses and the coupling constant is so strong, at least at longer distances or lower energies, let's say, that um, the uh, just pop U and D quarks out of the vacuum to U and D, Q, Q, U, U bar pairs, D, D bar pairs out of the vacuum to shield any uh, uh, non electric color electric field. And that's the real reason why this quark can find it. And he may be right. I don't, I don't know. It's regarded as a simple theoretical. So let's put it this way, it's the only explanation of confinement that one can formulate in a few words and have it understood. Um, the other approach is, well, you put the theory on lattice, you change the theory into a, dis into a compact gauge theory, a compact lattice theory. Anyway, you go through the whole Wilson formalism and um, you then see some evidence what I said, that's an artifact, is another, is another, is Anyway, if you compute the Hamiltonian density, what you do is you take the momenta times the, this is, in other words, this is pi qi dot minus l, okay, so h is pi qi dot minus l. Here, it's the conjugate momentum, the time derivatives of the fields, uh, minus l. And if you add in the part for the matter fields, then it's p0 psi l, where l, if the l labels the matter fields. You subtract the Lagrange density there. Let me just see what the time is. Oh, boy, we're almost out of time. Let's uh, say that if you do that, um, what you wind up with is you wind up with the Hamiltonian for the matter field that you expect, and then you get something pi alpha i pi a alpha zero minus f alpha beta gamma a beta zero a gamma i, and then plus a half pi alpha i, let me just square it, plus a half f alpha j squared. So this is b squared. Um, and then for the case of 
and this, where I and J just go over one and two, and then there's a half uh, D3 uh, uh, a alpha I squared minus a half D3 al a alpha zero squared. Remember, a alpha zero is a dependent variable, but it's it's kind of a mess because it's expressed in terms of the pi's and the f's, and um, in fact. The pi's of the s and the j's, so the matter variable, so it's rather complicated. All right, so that is your um, Hamiltonian density, and now, so let me just let me just sort of abbreviate this. What happens is if you now take this Hamiltonian density, you insert complete sets of states which are eigenstates of a alpha i and then also eigenstates of pi, beta j, say, and e minus i, epsilon h, where h is the integral of the space of that density. And then you, you, you go through the whole shtick. What you have then is a path integral, and it will be e to the, and let me just skip it will be something involving, well, all of these structures plus extra terms. So in other words, it's going to be something like um, pi alpha i, d0, a alpha i. So this is like the p, um, well, apart from an i, there's an i here. Uh, plus i pi d zero psi uh, minus h i h as you say, and d a d psi and so forth. Now the point is, that if you look at this whole structure here, you see that you've got a zero as a dependent variable. On the other hand, what is the value of a zero as a dependent variable? The value of a0 as a dependent variable is the value of a0 that makes this thing stationary. So apart from a prefactor that we're not going to worry about, since we can say that this whole thing is an integral of this whole structure, but now not simply dA and d psi, but also d a zero. So if we integrate over a zero, that's the same thing as just not integrating of a zero, but replacing a zero by the value that makes this thing stationary, which is the whole stick that I went through in the beginning. Okay, the upshot then, if you actually go through all this in detail and keep careful with everything is that your path integral looks like this. It's e to the i, the Lagrange density, d fourth x, you integrating them over all of the fields, but you have a delta functional here of a3. So you're, so in other words, it looks as though you're integrating, and you might as well integrate over so far, we're integrating over a1, a2, and a0. You add in a3, it doesn't matter because you have this to set a3 equals 0. So you're integrating over all the fields. You have the gauge invariant action, and then you have a gauge fixing term. And so that is basically. Um, so the only one integration is that gauge fixing term, right? Yes. And um, so what I, want, what I want to do next time then is to show you the Fadia Popov trick and the ghosts. Oh, yes. And that's what I was going to do. And what I did last time, the last lecture ended with, at, with basically this equation. And so I'm going to go forward with it next time. And then I'm going to do the Casimir effect. Yes. I'm looking at the Casimir effect probably carefully.
And if I use the Coulomb gauge, how, uh, does it appear in a similar fashion? If you say again. If I use the Coulomb gauge instead of this axial gauge? Uh, um, I, I, all right. If you use the Coulomb gauge instead of the axial gauge, um, what will happen? Let's see. Um, well, let me go to the. Let, let me go. Let, let's let, let, let's figure that out by using the Fadiev Popov trick. The Fadiev Popov trick is that you can rewrite this the, the, the fatty of pop up trick says that it, you can rewrite the, the the thing as an integral e to the i integral l d for that so the action then you have d a d psi and then you will have a gauge fixing term. Uh, and then you will have a correction factor that is a determinant. And you'll have then a determinant here. And so what will happen is you'll have the Coulomb gauge factor and then a determinant that's unique to the, it's, it's basically a Jacobian of how del dot a changes under an infinitesimal gauge transformation. It's that determinant, and then that throws, um, that throws this determinant up into the, up into the uh, action. So your 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 gate, the ghost term, oh, yes. okay. will be related to the gauge fixing term. But um, nobody uses the ghost. No, no, people use ghost. Nobody uses the Coulomb gauge because it's very complicated. Schwinger was incredibly good at calculating, especially at calculate anything, but if it was fancy stuff, he could plow through it. And simple stuff also, he could do everything. And um, so uh, he did it. But, and it might be useful to do it, but essentially nobody does that. All right, let's turn the thing off.